All right. Hallelujah. Welcome back to the uh, discipleship training course. And so we're going to uh, jump right in. Starting with uh, our preliminary poem called The World of Scripture. It says, welcome to my world. A place where the natural eyes can't see, where your physical bodies can't be, where the last is first, the first is last, the end is told from the beginning, when it appears as though one is losing, they're actually winning. Where trumpets are depicted as voices and the persecuted righteous don't complain, but actually rejoice. Here, swords are likened to the word of demons of bird, the dead are yet alive, the living are actually dead, blood and flesh are even depicted as wine and bread. It's a place where the humble are depicted as poor and the poor one becomes, they're later found to be that much richer. I'm speaking of no other place but the gospel world of scripture. So please turn off your phones, perk up your ears, and get ready to listen for the Ruach HaKodesh. It's about to begin teaching. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. So we're continuing on, and we are still concerning ourselves with Ab Abram or Abram, you know, and which, of course, means exalted father. And so uh, we're going to get into that today. And we're going to go on a little rabbit trail today because, you know, um, <sighs> Yeah, I kind of put it on my heart that it was necessary. Uh, I would have rather avoided it, but you know, <laughs> just being honest. But you know, yeah, says otherwise. You know, so uh, we're still in the realm of you know concerning ourselves with Ivan and and Melchizedek has come on the scene, and you know, so yeah. Uh, See if we can't get up to speed with what's going on. Some pretty important stuff happening here. Oh, so last week we spoke about how Melchizedek had two kingdoms. Mm. Yeah, of course. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So last week we spoke about how Melchizedek had two kings, which corresponded to Abram's or man's two natures. <laughs> you don't like when I say that, though. <laughs> 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 you know, and you know, who remembers man's two natures? Heavenly and earthly. Heavenly and earthly, yes. Man has two natures, one heavenly, one earthly. Uh, we also spoke um, how in ancient times, the covenant of bread and the covenant of wine were two distinct covenants, you know, which also um, correlate with, with man's two natures, you know. And so last week I said that, Yahweh Melchizedek was given Abram an invitation, so to speak, into his family tribe and promising him nourishment as long as he stayed with him and, um, of course, followed the house rules. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, we spoke about, you know, and, and um, we spoke about Yah being the king of Salem, giving Abram an invite to enter into what was called a covenant of friendship. Oh, you know, uh, in the ancient times, you know, and so uh, it was imperative and it is imperative for us to understand the cultural norm of that day concerning deities, promises, oaths, covenants, mm -hmm. etc. You know, today it's fair to say that the cultural norm is for folks to lump all these elements into one, you know, and they're not one. You know, and, and so like, you know, this meant everything to the people of the East, you know, that were the people of scripture. And so if we don't understand these things, you know, then we're not going to properly understand the perspective that Yah is, is coming from, that he's, that he's telling us things. Amen? Yes. Amen. You know. Because uh, if someone speaks to you and they're utilizing, you know, ancient day idioms, and you're not familiar with that ancient culture, mm -hmm. then you're not going to, 
you're likewise not going to um, be familiar with those ancient idioms, and so they're not going to they're not going to understand. And that's that's true even in today's time with present day idioms. You go to different parts of the country, uh, the world, or the country even, and you know they have different idioms. You know. And if you don't know, you're not familiar with the idioms, then you you you'll be kind of at a loss. Mm -hmm. You know, just for for instance, you know, within within uh, you know the communities, you know, in and about Detroit, there's a saying that's kind of unique to Detroit. You know, and if someone came here, they would have no idea, you know, what was being spoken of. And you know, and that that phrase that phraseology is is what up though. <laughs> what up though is native to Detroit, you know, and you know it's a term of endearment, endearment, you know, and just you know um, a way of saying you know hello to a friend, you know. Nevertheless, you know, like those of us who know, we know, but those of us who don't. Don't and it sounds ridiculous. It's like, what do you mean? You know, uh, what's a doe? A doe is a is a you know a female deer. You know, and, you know. So it's like you know this would make absolutely no sense. You know, but every language, without exception, has idioms. Every language has slang terms. You know that that you know cater to the culture. And so that's important to understand. Yeah, I pray that you uh, you straighten this uh, this out. Cause it's kind of nerve wracking. I know the Prince of the Air is trying to do his thing. Oh yeah, it's definitely plugged up. You know, uh, you know. So so yeah. So I'm just saying that to say that you know these things mean mean something you know now the giving of bread and wine you know was an invitation for Abram to enter into these covenants you know with Elohim they weren't the actual they weren't the actual covenants themselves only the invitations to do so okay and once you know once you understand what a covenant is you know that it could not have been a covenant you know because you know the the um the word for, for covenant, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the Hebrew is a reason, you know, which means to cut, you know, because you cut a covenant, you know, because there was you, you, there is no covenant without blood. Okay, you know, and so I just want you to understand that. So it, it wasn't a it wasn't a covenant, you know, and like you know, even in the earlier part of um, the story of our room. There was no covenant made, you know? So we're gonna go over some of these things today, you know? So under, I want you to understand that our story starts off with a promise, a promise, not a covenant, okay? You know, and this promise is given in Genesis 12, one through seven. Can I have my first reader read Genesis 12, one through seven, please? Now Yahuwah had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as Yahuwah had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreb. And the Canaanite was then in the land, and Yahuwah appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto Yahuwah, who appeared unto him. 
Hallelujah. Okay. So hereby we see y'all making an album of promise. Not an oath, nor a covenant, but a promise. You know, um, mm -hmm. and so this promise was that if Abram would get out of his his home country, mm -hmm. you know, let me put it let me put it another way that that you know, because I, I want you to be able to identify um, with what Yah wants you to do as well, mm -hmm. you know, and how it applies to you, you know. So you know, basically, you know what Yah was saying, he, what he was telling Abram, and what he tells every would be believer. You know, is if you get out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, and get away from thy kindred mm -hmm. and from thy father's house mm -hmm. unto a land I will show thee. Mm -hmm. See, and when one is in their own country, they're by default, they're more comfortable because you know they know they know more people. And when they're with their kindred in their father's house, you know, everyone's family. So again, they're quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and when you leave that comfort zone. You know, it could be a bit intimidating. You know, how many went off to college, you know, and, you know, stayed somewhere else? You know, remember how that felt when you first left home? Yeah, it felt liberating, you know, for many people. <laughs> and they felt like they got in prison. But, you, know, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, it was a bit intimidating, you know, because when you finally got there and you're like, okay, now if you went with friends, you know, you had some type of, you know, associates, but I want you, you know, to you picture the same thing, but you know, no one, mm -hmm. you don't know anyone, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that pretty much happened to me, you know, I ended up going to Las Vegas, you know, I pretty much didn't know anyone, you know, and so, yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, it can be a bit intimidating, let me just put it that way, you know, but this is what y'all was asking Auburn to do, leave out your comfort zone, leave your security, you know, um, so like, you know, of course, at your father's house, nobody's going to bother you, you know, you have, you have security, right, you know, I mean, the city he lived in was named after his brother, so you know, it was, it was full of his people, right, you know, leave your comfort zone, leave your security blanket, you know, and go where I tell you. And if you do, I promise you, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so Abram took them up on a deal. Mm -hmm. And in verse 5, it tells us, and into the land of Canaan they came. So he left. He went, went where he told him. You know, he crossed over the border, and then he had to continue on. And he continued on into Sikkim. Now, I have you know that Sikkim is like right in the middle of the land of Canaan. So he got to, you know, he want me to go, go into the land of Canaan. Okay, I'm going into the land of Canaan. I'm right in the, in the midst of the land of Canaan. I stopped. What you want me to do now? Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm in the midst of the land you told me to go to, right? You know, and it says, and Yahuwah appeared unto Abram. He, he did what, what um, Yah asked him to do, you know, and he got there and Yah appeared to him. And then we're told, and there built, built he an altar unto Yahuwah who appeared unto him. Okay, so, you know, hereby we see he made a promise Abram kept up his end of the bargain. Now, guess what? Yah is on the hook. Mm -hmm. This is where you want Yah. You want him on the hook. Mm -hmm. Keep his promise to you. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. You know? But well, this is where Abram has him, you know? But, you know, remember, Yah came to Abram. Yep. You know, Yah came to Abram. Tell him, look, look here, I want to use you. You know? 
I want to use you. I need you to do this for me. If you do this for me, then I promise you I'll do, do this, that, and the other for you. <laughs> right? That's what he that's what he did, right? Yeah. All right. Consider Genesis 13, 1 through 4. And Abram went up out of Mizraim. And he and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been in the beginning between, between Bethel and, and, and Hai, you know, unto a place, of the, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And Abram called on the name of Yahuwah. All right. You know, so, you know, there was a famine in the land and Abram ended up going to Nisraim and, you know, and came out. He was rich in cattle, silver, and gold, right? You know, now, here it is. Abram comes and talks to, uh, to uh, Abram again, you know, and tells him in verses 14 through 18, he said, it says, and Yahuwah said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from you, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee uh, will I give it unto thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it. For I will give it unto you. And Aaron removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Havilah, and built there an altar unto Yahuwah. And so here it is, he's on the move again, you know, because now he understands Yah wants him to walk throughout all the land because this is the land he's going to give him in the sea, you know, so he wants him to be familiar with it, you know. So back on the uh, road he goes. And then uh, we have. Uh, Genesis 14, 13 through 20. Uh, let me have my next reader read Genesis 14, 13 through 20, you know, and see what happens next with Abba. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, he dwelled, well, he dwelled in the high plain of Mari, uh, the Amorite, brother of Esco and brother of Abner, and these were confederate with, Ab with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was, was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And, if, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night he smote them and purchased and pursued them unto Cobra, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and, and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of the ship. Shadow uh, Lamar, Lamar, whatever, and of the kings that were with him at, at the valley of Shavar, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the, the prince. He was the priest of the most high Elohim. And he blessed him and said, Blessed he be Abram of the Most High, Elohim, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed he and blessed be the Most High Elohim, which has delivered thine enemy into the hand, and he gave him titles of all. Ties. Uh, ties of all, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so. Here it is, you know, we see that's whilst, whilst in the land, Abram run into a little problem, you know. Well, actually his, uh, his nephew run into a little problem, but his nephew problem is his problem, because that's his family, right? Mm -hmm. Only family he has in that land. 
you know, so, you know, he has to, you know, go and defend his family, you know, and so, you know, he, he goes and do so, and take note that it was Yah who gave him the victory, you know, verse 20, which have delivered thine enemies, blessed be the most high Elohim, which have delivered thy enemies into thy hand, you know, and so, it says he gave him tithes of all, all right, uh, Probably don't vote for in that order. But anyway, so again, Melchizedek was given Abram an invitation into his family or tribe and promised him nourishment as long as he stayed with him and, um, and of course, followed the house rules. Now, what I want you to, to be, want you to see is that Yah made Abram a promise. And at this point, Yah kept that promise. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as we said, uh, Yahweh, the king of Salem, is giving Abram an invite to enter what is called in ancient times um, amongst the peoples of the East, a covenant of friendship. You know, and so, you know, he's giving them, a, uh, offering them a covenant of bread, you know, which was nourishment, you know, promising to him that he will, he will, you know, make certain that, you know, he is nourished at all times, you know, he makes certain that he's nourished and that he's well kept, you know, physically, you know, and then the, uh, the covenant of friendship is a covenant whereby it was actually, you know, um, when it was actually entered into as a covenant, you know, where there was actual blood, you know, then it was, it was, you know, my life is your life type deal, you know, it was a, uh, uh, a unification, you know, that took place, you know, uh, and so, like, this is what Yah was inviting Abram, you know, into, you know, and I want you to see that first he made a promise, then he killed his promise, so, uh, you know, I want you to be able to see that, you know, when he made that promise in, in, let's just back up. When he made that promise in, in, in Genesis 12, he said he's going to make of him a great nation. You know, I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, when he came back, you know, after winning that battle with those five kings, after the peoples of the land of, of Canaan, is, is, um, not Canaan, but Sodom and Gomorrah and the other, um, Zor and the other uh, two cities, you know, after they were defeated, and he went and defeated those who defeated them and, and took back the people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that his name was great mm -hmm. in that in that land? Do you think he was foreseen as a great nation? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because he, you know, he 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 had, you know, just being conservative. Just being conservative, he had, you know, um, 500 people, you know, to to his camp, at least, you know, you know, um, and that's being super duper conservative. Why? Because he had 318 servants that was born in his house yeah. that he that was that was trained that he took with. Him. Now, that's not counting women and children. So. His camp would have been well over 500. I, I pray you can see that. You know, so I'm just being conservative here, you know, to show you that, you know, he was a great nation, not so much in numbers, you know, but, you know, in being able to pull off this victory, you know, with Yah working with him to pull off this victory. Now, the promise also was, I will bless thee. Now we see Melchizedek coming and doing what? Bless Blessing. Thanks. Right? Said, I will make thy name great. Now he just defeated five kings. You know, and he's neither he or his confederates were kings. You think his name became great? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and he says, and thou shalt be a blessing. When he came back, those cities that had lost their battle and had their people and their goods taken, he freely gave it back. Was he a blessing to him? Yeah. You know, says, Thou shalt be a blessing. Surely he was a blessing. It says, I will bless them that bless thee. The only ones who took a portion 
were the ones that was in confederate with them, the Amorite brothers. Mm -hmm. They were blessed because he was blessed. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And this is what he said. He said, no, I'm not going to take nothing, but I, I, can't, I can't speak for their portion. You know, they get, they, they, they get their portion because, you know, they, they fought. You know, they was right there with us. You know, so they were blessed because of the blessing of Abraham. You know, and it says, you know, and curse him that curse of thee. Now, when he went into Mitzrayim, he was cursed when they took his other half. And she was in danger of being becoming defiled. And then his mate would have been defiled and he wouldn't have been able to, you know, have offspring with him. You know, but because they wronged him, Yah wronged them. They were cursed because he was cursed. Can you see that? So he truly did curse him that cursed, that cursed Abba. And it says, indeed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And we see, you know, that all those families of Sodom, Gomorrah, Zor, and those other two, um, two uh, uh, cities, all their families were blessed because of him. As well as the uh, Amorite brothers that was in confederacy uh, with him. They also was blessed. You know, so we see you know, especially those who were in confederate with the Amorite brothers, you know, from the plain of uh, Mammy, we, we see them as a type of first fruit, you know, of these families that, that will become blessed because of him. Can you see that? I pray you can see that. You know, and so I'm showing you this so that you, so that you can see, you know, that Yah kept his end of the bargain. You know, he kept his end of the bargain. And so here it is. Abram kept his end of the bargain. He went where Yah told him to go. And Yah did what he said he was going to do. So Yah came to Abram, told him, hey, I want to use you but I need you to go here, you know, in order for me to do that. And if you do this, then I promise, you know, that I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. Abram accept this pledge given by Yah, goes where he tells him, and receive the this, that, and the other that Yah, Yah promised. Yep. Can you see that, that that's what happened? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. You know, so now when we come to Melchizedek, Yah is now coming and offering an invite to covenant with him. So it's like he came and pledged to Abu. You know, it's just like if I come to one of you all and I, you know, and I make you a promise, hey, if you, you know, I, I need, I need you. If you if you work with me, then I promise to do this, that, and the other. You know, and you like, uh, but imagine I'm a stranger. And you're like, well, yeah, sound good, you know, um, you know, but somehow I talk you into it and you're like, okay. Uh, and then, you know, you do what, what I asked and, and I make good on my promise, you know, and, and now I still need you, you know, and so, but now that you see that I'm a man of my word, now I'm asking you, hey, why don't you enter into partnership with me? Why don't you covenant with me? So you can be a part of my plan, you know, that I'm trying to do, you know, because I see that that you, you were obedient and you see that I was faithful. Amen? You know, and, you know, I need someone obedient and you need a deity that's going to be faithful to you. You know, you need a deity that's going to, that's gonna make certain you stay nourished. You're gonna you need a deity that's gonna make certain that your life is 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 spared. 
you know? And, and so, you know, when they mess with you, they actually messing with me. Right. Right. See, that's what happens when you enter into covenant yep. with someone. When you enter into covenant, there's a unification that takes place. You know, and so if he accepts this covenant, you know, then a unification will take place. And then, you know, they will become one in the same. Their lives will become intermingled. Yeah. That's what happens when you enter into covenant. You know, uh, when, you know, so, so, but that, that needs blood to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you, that's, that's not just words. You know, that's like the, the highest, you know, um, form of commitment, you know, and so, you know, blood has to be involved. And so I want you to understand that because, you know, um, you know, you read so, so many commentaries and so many people say like, you know, oh, okay, you know, you read uh, uh, Genesis 12 and they're like, oh yeah, that, you know, that was when y'all made his covenant with, with Adam. No, it's not. That's when he made him a promise. You know, so uh, I want us to understand the cultural norm of that day concerning deities and promises and oaths and covenants. You know, a deity, you know, was, you know, uh, was a God. What is a, what is a God? Strong judge or ruler, mm -hmm. right? You know, and so, you know, the peoples, and now this is not just in Israel. I want you to understand that there's not a region on this planet that did not have a history of blood sacrifices mm -hmm. and blood covenants. Mm -hmm. Please understand that. This was something that was that's, that was central to the world at large. There's no civilization. They can't find any civilization that didn't have these, these blood covenants. Mm -hmm. All the ancient civilizations had them. And that's, that's crucial that you understand that. You know, so I want you to, you to be able to see that. You know, but I want you to also see that Yah, he didn't do, he, would, he, he set himself apart from the other gods. Mm -hmm. You know, because usually with the other gods, it was the people who would petition the gods. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they would offer a sacrifice, you know, in hopes of uh, alluring or attracting mm -hmm. certain gods. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they would make a sacrifice, you know, to invite that God. See, but y'all didn't work that way. Y'all went to the person and pledged themselves to the person. Can you see the difference? Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's the total opposite of the norm. You know, so Yah was setting himself apart. This was unusual in, in biblical days in those ancient times. You know, the deities, the gods didn't petition the people. The people petitioned the God. Mm -hmm. You know, and they would invoke those gods through their blood sacrifices because it was believed that I'm getting ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. All right, let me slow down. All right, so let me show you some examples. Okay, we have First Kings. Chapter one, one through four says, then Moab rebelled against Israel, you know, after the death of, of uh, uh, oh, let me, let me, uh, uh, let me say this before, before we go forward, you know, you know, just to show you like, yeah, this was, this was unusual. Like the norm was, like I said, you know, they would do a blood sacrifice and then they would invite the God and then they would petition the God. You know, so they would invite the God to the sacrifice and through the sacrifice, there will be a uh, intermingling or a unification that's made. And so then, you know, they will petition the God for what they want. You understand? You know, and so I just wanted to uh, show like, you know, like Yah came to Abba. And so you see the process is reversed. Yah come to Abba. And after y'all come to Abram, 
Abram builds an altar to Yah. Mm -hmm. So he sacrifices after Yah comes to him. Not before. He don't sacrifice and Yah is drawn to his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You see, see the difference? Mm -hmm. You know, also, you know, um, when he come up out of, out of um, Mitzrayim, you know, Yah had just brought him up out of Mitzrayim miraculously, you know, um, because, you know, he had put that curse upon Pharaoh and his whole household, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when Abram gets up out of there and gets gets settled, what does he do? He, he um, go to the altar and call on the name of Yahuwah. Again, this is backwards. You know, normally what you would see is like, okay, they come, they took Sarah, and then Abram would petition Yah, you know, um, by making sacrifice to him and, you know, and petition him to do, you know, to do his, 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 his bidding. Mm -hmm. You see? But that's not how, how it went. You know, Yah is setting himself apart from all the other gods. Say, no. I don't need that. I don't need. I don't need that. That blood. Like he'll say later. I don't enjoy the blood of goats and, and sheep and bulls. You know. You know. So we see this process is reversed when it comes to Yah. You know. So you know. Here it is. Yah come and then Abram out of gratitude. You know, gives an offering to Yah because he didn't know what else to do because the the um, cultural norm of his day was okay you know to appease a deity you offered sacrifice hmm. you know and so this is what he was doing mm -hmm. you know y'all came to him though you know he didn't he didn't have to petition him, you know and so same thing in, in misraim when he comes out and then in um verses 14 through 18 again we see yahuwah said unto abel and you know and then after he came and came unto him and he spoke with him. What does Abram do? He built there an altar unto Yah. And he offered another sacrifice. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you see how he's doing this in reverse order? Mm -hmm. You know? So, you know, that's important that we see that. Because this is this is showing Yah to be that holy L. Yeah. You know, that set apart L. Yeah. You know, he's not, he's not doing it like, uh, like the pagan gods. You know, he's setting himself apart. You know, and so here it is in Genesis 14, you know, um, 13 through 20, we see that he dwelt in the plan of uh, Mamre, you know, and he, he went and he uh, had to fight to get his family back and Yah helped him. Now, now check this out. Instead of after the end of this, instead of, you know, he didn't get a chance to make it back home to offer a sacrifice to uh to Yah on the altar. Instead, Yah sent someone to him. Mm. Can you see that? Mm. This time, you know, he's like, no, nah, we're gonna do something different this time. Mm. This time, Yah sent his representative to him to offer him an opportunity to enter into covenant with him. Mm. So after he he's come and he's pledged himself to Abram and Abram was obedient yep. and he, he see like okay I chose the right one and mm -hmm. Abram you know sees that he he uh, that he was an El, Elohim of, of, of his word he kept his promises it put him in a perfect position to enter into covenant mm -hmm. yep. you know okay now yeah, I know I can trust you you know you can trust me so you know I need I need to get this job done you know, I need somebody I can trust. You know, so let's enter into partnership now. Now that you know, now that we know we can trust one another. You see how that, see how that's going? Yeah. You know, and so this is what Melchizedek come to send, to get a proposition. I forgot to put that verse in. Hmm. Um, and so this is what we see here. Melchizedek coming to bring that, op, that proposition. And this is why he gives him the bread and the wine, you know, uh, which is a proposition of, the bread covenant and the uh, covenant of friendship, you know, and in exchange, you know, 
in exchange and or in acknowledgement, I should say, you know, Abram gives him tithes of all. Mm -hmm. You know, and you see this repeated. You know, I, I don't have the passage up here, but um, preferably you know your scripture and you'll you'll be able to identify with what I'm talking about. When Jacob is going, when he's going to Laban, going to his uncle's house, and he goes to this very same place, this very same place where Abram was staying right here, Bethel, you know, and he has, he uses a rock for a pillow, right? And he has, he has a dream, and Yah gives him some promises. Yah makes some promises to him, right? And Yah say, you know, okay, and this is this is how, how it's gonna be. But Yah could say, no, nah, hold on, because you know, you, you know, I don't know you, you I, I don't know if you who you say you are. You know, I mean, I'm I'm ad libbing. You know, um, you know, even that you say that, but. You know, this is what is what's implied. I, I don't I don't really know if you know who you say you are. You know, if you keep your promises and bring me back safe, then I'll give you tithes. I'll give you tithes of all. I'll give you 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, and we later see that y'all can make good on that promise, yeah. you know, because y'all made good on his promise. You see, you see how that goes. See, you know, but again, Yah came to Yaakov while he was dreaming. It's not that Yaakov made a sacrifice unto Yah, and then, you know, Yah answered the call of the sacrifice. That's the way it normally went. But that's not the way it works with Yah. You understand? I pray that you can understand. I pray it's, you know, I'm not coming off confusing, you know. You know, and so this is why you see Yaakov, he pours the oil on the rock, which is actually a type of sacrifice. But then, okay, let me, let me keep going. All right. Um, so we have Moab, you know, uh, just to show you like this was not the norm. Second Kings chapter one, one through four. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through, the, through a lattice in his upper chamber. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so so it's this problem, you know, Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Moab. As Isaiah, he's king now, and he falls through a lattice in his upper chamber, you know, um, that was in Samaria, and so he got sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, go inquire of the Elzebub, you know, um, of uh, the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Now, take note that he wants to petition to God. So he sends messengers hmm. to go and petition to God. And of course, he's going to send them with, with uh, you know, some type of payment or, you know, a retribution, you know, for the petition. You understand? This is how it was normally done. You know, if you wanted, if you wanted something from one of the deities, then you would have to sacrifice unto them, mm. you know, or you would have to go and pay one of their priests to sacrifice on your behalf. You understand? Mm -hmm. This is how this normally went, mm. you know, um, you know, but unfortunately, well, you know, it was fortunate, but unfortunate, but Ahaziah, you know, like he was already covenanted. You know, with with Yahuwah, and Yahuwah is a jealous hell. Right. Amen. Yeah. You know, and so we read in verse three, it says, But the angel of Yahuwah said unto Eliyahu, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not an Elohim in Israel mm -hmm. that ye go and inquire of the elders above, the God of Ekron? Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, thus saith Yahuwah. Thou shalt not come down from that bed which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. Mm -hmm. And Eliyahu departed. Mm -hmm. So you see, that's how it normally went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not how this normally goes either. You know, you <laughs> don't just 
keep blinking. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at another example. Second Kings five five through eight it says, and the king of Syria said, "Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel." Let me give you a little backdrop to the story. Okay, so this is a story concerning Naaman, and so Naaman you know, uh, was a fierce warrior, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was like one of the head commanders of the army of Syria, right, and so he had this little, this little maiden, Israel, Israelite maiden, you know, that, that he had acquired, you know, through the spoils of war, and so um, he had, he was a leper, and so his wife was worried about him, and the maiden, you know, served his wife, and he was, he was like, man, you know, if he was, if he was uh, in, in Israel, if he, you know, was, went to a prophet in Israel, he can he, he heal, you know? And so, you know, uh, she told uh, Naaman, Naaman told King, King said, okay, you know, well, let's try it. You know, so the king of Syria said, go to, go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of ring. Now, I want you to see, like, you know, when you went to these prophets, when you went to them to petition the God on your behalf, you didn't go empty handed. You know, you may remember the story of Saul or Saul, you know, when they were going to see, uh, when they was going to see Shemuel, they was like, but we don't have nothing to bring them. Because everybody knew if you're going to go petition the God, then you, you know, you have to bring something you know what i'm saying there has to be some kind of sacrifice and sacrifices were free and the prophet's time wasn't free amen you know so this is this is how they got done and so here it is we see in verses five and verse six it says and he brought the letter to the king of israel saying now when this letter is coming to thee behold i have there will sent naaman my servant to thee that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy and it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter, he rent his clothes mm -hmm. and said, am I Elohim mm -hmm. to kill and to make alive that this man do have send me to recover a man of his leprosy? <laughs> Wherefore, consider, I pray you and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Mm -hmm. Like he just, he just want to fight, <laughs> you know, what did it to me, you know, recover this man of leprosy. And so it was so when Elisha, the man of Elohim, this is why it's good to have a man of Elohim. Right. You know, it was so when Elisha, the man of Elohim, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that, that he sent to the king saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? What am I? You know, chop liver? What you mean? Oh, no, he didn't say all that. He said, let him come down to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. <laughs> Now he's like, no, no, don't play me, sick. Don't play me, cheek. The, the, the hell I serve. Okay. He willing. Right. Amen. Right. You know. Yeah. Don't put no limits on on my hell. <laughs> you know. And of course, he went and he got healed. Right. Yeah. You know. But what I want you to see is the way that deities were petitioned. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know. So again, I show you a, a, another witness of how you know they petitioned them they didn't come to him you know y'all didn't come to name and say hey go see my man you, you see what i'm saying you know you know uh this is how it was done and one more example found the first kings 18 25 through 28 and this is what what my man eliyahu again and it says and eliyahu said unto the prophets of baal look you gotta love this story <laughs> yeah you gotta love this <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so yeah, he, he, Eliyahu said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, for ye are many, and call call on the name of your um, gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning uh, even until noon. You know, from morning eve, even until noon, saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answers. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Eliyahu who mocked them, saying, Cry aloud. You know, you're not maybe you're not yelling loud enough. But he is a guy. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he's a, in a journey. Or peradventure he's sleeping. And must be awake. You know, you, you gotta cry a little louder. 
you know, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till blood gushed out upon them. Now, this is important. This is very important because this is, this is, you know, a big part of the reason that we came here and we're going to do a little rabbit trail here because um, this is actually like something that, you know, I wanted to take a deeper dive into anyway. And so y'all just put it before us. And so gave me the opportunity to do so. So we're going to do so, mm -hmm. right? Okay, it says, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner with knives and lances. The manner, the custom, the manners and customs of the pagan people around the world was to offer blood sacrifices. Mm -hmm. You have to understand this. You know, it was the same as, you know, the covenants that, that we enter into today, or I'm sorry, that's old term terminology, old school terminology, contracts we enter into today. Mm -hmm. So the covenant of old is just simply the contract of today. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. You know, so I want you to be able to see that. See, because the whole justice system in this country and just about every other country is based upon contract law. Mm -hmm. You, you you have to understand that. Mm. You know, when you a lot of people think that when they go to see the judge at the courtroom, that the judge is there to determine who's right and wrong. No, he, he, he technically speaking, he's not. You know, he's there to determine who has breached their contract. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that he's there. Yeah. You have to understand these things. You know, okay, so take note that the pagans believe that their gods were fed and nourished by the blood of sacrifices. Mm. This is why you see them cutting themselves. You know, now they already done cut the um the bull, mm. the actual sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But it's, it was believed that human blood, you know, was, uh, was more preferred mm. than animal blood. Mm -hmm. You know, because a human life form was a higher life form yeah. than an animal life form. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so this is why they used the bull. The bull was the highest animal life form. You see? Mm -hmm. You know, and so, but when that didn't get the job done, mm -hmm. you know, the priests of Baal, they began crying out loud and cutting themselves, you know, to entice Baal to come to the meal. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how they did. You know, so take note that the pagans believed that their gods were fed and nourished by the blood of the sacrifices, not the flesh, not the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, their deities didn't consume the flesh. That's important to note as well. It was all about the blood. You know, hence they gathered together blood for their devils. Mm -hmm. They'll gather the blood for their devils from their sacrifice. And they did also eat of that same blood and flesh of the sacrifice as the devil's guest. So this is this is what they were doing when they offered the sacrifice. They would pour out the blood and they would leave the blood pool. They'll they'll pull it together, you know, or put it in a bowl, you know, for the deity, mm -hmm. you know. And then they would they would uh uh you know um set, sometimes sometimes they cooked the meat, sometimes they did. You know, but they would then eat some of the blood and the flesh, you know, of the sacrifice, you know, and they would be as the devil's guest, mm -hmm. and thereby they would be conjoined with the devil. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they were conjoined with the devil is because of the blood. Mm -hmm. See, they understood, even as scripture teaches, that the life was in the blood. The nephesh, the soul, was in the blood. And so when they both partook of the same blood or soul, then they became one with that blood or soul. And so they became one blood or soul. And so this is how, you know, they were able to enter into unification with the devil. Mm -hmm. You understand? You know, I pray, I pray, I pray you understand. I pray that that's kind of clear. You know, um, now, you know, because of this custom, because of this manner, hence we find the commandment 
mm -hmm. um, you know, not to drink the blood or eat the blood, yeah. but to cover it with earth and not to eat the flesh with the blood. Yeah. You know, this was predicated upon the practices that was um, prevailing in that day and time. Yeah. You know, consider Leviticus 17, 7 through um, 13, it says, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Mm -hmm. See, this is what they were doing. Mm -hmm. This is, it's not just them. This is what the world at large was doing. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you be hard pressed to find a community, any community in the world that didn't practice this. Mm -hmm. I don't care what civilization you go to, you know, and the highest form of sacrifice was human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, it was done by the Aztecs, the Mayans, you know, and, and many other, many, many other cultures, you know, around the world. And so you, you always, when you go back to antiquity, you always see this. You always find these blood sacrifices, you know, to these pagan gods. You know, so I want you to understand that. And so the people of Israel were no different. They was doing like everyone else. Hence, Yah says, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Where did they learn that from? Being in Mitzrayim. You know, Mitzrayim was ran by, by their priests. You know, and the priests were all the firstborn. You know, and so you have to understand this. This is why Yah, when he was bringing them out of Mitzrayim, he killed all the firstborn. Yeah, he catch that. Yeah. You know, he was destroying the priesthood and destroying the gods. Mm -hmm. He was letting them know that he is the God above all gods. And the gods can't do nothing about it, and their priests can't do anything about mm -hmm. it. And he was showing emphatically that he was the most high El. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so here it is, he's telling them. In Leviticus 17, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Don't do it no more. After whom they have gone a horn. This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers which sojourn among you that offer a burnt offering of sacrifice and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto Yahuwah, even that man should be cut off from among his people. So you couldn't, you couldn't give offerings nowhere else. Right. Hmm. And actually, he says, bring it to the door. The whole reason because of, the, um, of bringing it to the door is because that was a type of, um, of covenant. It was called a threshold covenant. Hmm. You know, and that's, that's a different chapter in another book. But that was a type of covenant. You know, and this is why he's saying bringing it, bring it um, not, uh, and if, if you don't bring it unto the door of the tabernacle, you know, of the congregation to offer it unto Yahuwah. You know, and maybe one day we'll get into that threshold covenant because it has everything, everything to do with Passover. Mm -hmm. You know, which was a threshold covenant. You know, um, it says, even that man shall be cut off from among his people and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eat of any manner of blood. You know, I will even set my face against that soul that eat of blood. And so we know, you know, this the manners and customs of the people that was eaten um, this blood, you know, as I described, you know, the 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 uh the custom to you, you know, um, and this is you know, this is found from you know ancient writings from you know around the world, you know, such as the Mari tablets, you know, um, you know, which which they have, you know, like thousands of, you know, and it it, it gave a gave a very clear depiction of what life was like, you know, in like the uh, Babylonia region, you know, which is the same region that Avram came from. Amen.
you know, you know, but like, you know, other, uh, other documents, you know, likewise was found, you know, in different places of the world and, 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 and interviewing people and talking to, you know, ancient civilizations or, or old civilizations that have ancient roots, you know, many of them still do some where they were still doing some of these things. And even some still do it to this day. You know, some of the ones that haven't been, you know, uh, modernized, if you would, you know, for lack of a better term, you know. And so verse 10, whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or other strangers that sojourn among you that eat of any manner of blood, I will set my face against that soul that eat of blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yah even admits it. He even lets us know the soul is in the blood, mm -hmm. you know? And so it is believed like these demons who are, you know, disembodied, you know, um, disembodied beings, you know, that they're able to manifest themselves, you know, in, in, in our present realm, mm -hmm. you know, when they have some blood, mm -hmm. you know? And so this is why they're thankful you know, to the point to where they're willing to grant petitions. Mm -hmm. Say a lot. You know, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Soul for soul. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. You know, therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood neither shall any stranger that's a journey among you eat blood and whatsoever man there be of the children of israel or of the strangers that's a journey among you which hunt up and catch up any beast or fowl that may be eaten he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust you see you know he did not want them sacrificing unto devils anymore you know, and this is was this was the whole gist be, behind, you know, uh, getting rid of the blood, you know, so that they're not doing this practice of pulling the blood, you know, and eating the flesh, you know, with the blood in order to unify themselves with devils. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is what is being alluded to, you know, with this passage. Mm -hmm. You know, so I want I want folks to understand that you know um, the 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 essence of of what Yah is trying to get across. Because if you don't understand, if we don't understand this cultural aspect, then we're not going to properly understand what he's talking about. You know, and take note that he says, "I will even set my face in verse ten. I will even set my face against that soul that eat of blood." Mm -hmm. And every time he used this wording about Yah setting his face against against that uh, a soul, mm -hmm. you know, is is in you know is usually in relation to you know some type of idolatry, you know, mm -hmm. such as here sacrificing them the devils or idols or you know, uh, some kind of type of way they, they've committed, you know, um, uh, spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. uh, consider this this uh, this other place in Leviticus 20 where it's used. It says, And Yahuwah spake unto Moshe, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, mm -hmm. He shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people. Because he hath given his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary, to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And the soul that turn up after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards 
or go a whoring after them, I will set my face against that soul. I will cut him off from among his people. And so again, you see, like every you know, time that this terminology is utilized, it's in conjunction with some type of idolatry, some type of like, spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like I want you to understand, like, you know, again, when the blood is involved, you know, it speaks to a unification. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, you know, um, you, you hear about them going a whoring, you know, committing whoredom, you know, meaning like they're they're becoming, you know, what when you when you, let me put it like this, when you enter into a marriage you know, with, with, um, with someone, you become one with them, right? Yeah. You know, and that's a type of blood covenant. This is why they married virgins, you know, um, you know, you know, I mentioned that so that you can see the blood involved in the intermingling, yeah. you know, and they become one, you know, it's the blood that causes them to become one that causes you know, you to become one with a deity, you know, um, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's Yah or whether it's a pagan deity, you know, it happens with the blood. This is why you hear so much about, you know, we're saved by the blood of Yahshua. Amen. Yeah. You know, so, you know, um, I just want to, you know, point this out and try to drive this this point home hmm. you know uh and so i want you to see that you know it was you know again he'll set his face against those that enter into unification with other gods you know whether it's through familiar spirits it's through wizards you know he don't want you intermingling your soul with no other deity outside him. This is why he says he's a jealous heir. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so when you go on and you becoming one, you know, with, with any and every deity, mm -hmm. then you acting like a yes. <laughs> you know, and so this is what he didn't want. You know, and so I'm just trying to paint that picture. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's all I have for you today. Prayer was a blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.